Okay, welcome back. We are looking today at Genesis chapter three. Uh, we've so far we've covered the the creation of the world um, in the six days. Uh, we covered the the second account of creation, which is I think is worth going over again because that will set the stage for chapter three, which is in the fall, and then the curse that comes from it. So I want to take again just a quick review, a look at the. The, the, the second account of creation, which is in Genesis 2, where we zoom in on the garden and we get a sense of the man and the woman, where they come from, their purpose, and that really provides uh, our understanding of what went wrong in chapter 3, and it will make sense of the curses that will be coming as well. So let's take a look at that. Uh, Genesis chapter 2, let's read it one more time. Uh, verses fifth, We'll start with chapter 2, verses 15 um to well we'll just start with 15 to 17 we'll start there bob thomas would you get that for us sure the lord god took the man and put him in the garden of eden to work it and keep it and the lord god commanded the man saying you may surely eat of every tree of the garden but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you should not eat for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die okay now in just these couple of verses we're reminded again of god has given a, a job for the man to do and he's given him a prohibition so there's a positive and there's a negative in this for the man what what is his job what is his purpose uh at this in this passage to tend the garden yeah uh he says he gives him two words there to uh uh to, to work it and to keep it. So the, the idea is that this garden is a garden that God planted, if I recall, that the Lord planted um, in Eden, verse 8. The Lord God planted the garden, and his, he gives it to the man as a gift, and the man's job is to work it and to keep it. So prune it, to, to harvest it, to... Uh, protect it and to take care of it. The, the garden's a gift to him. He's given dominion in it, but uh, it's one of grace that the Lord has given to him. But in that amazing gift that God gives to him, he gives him the whole place, he has one prohibition for the man. And that not is? To, not to eat in the the, from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Yeah, the, not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Just that one tree is the only one, and if you eat of it, you will surely die. That's it. That's the only prohibition we have so far, as I can see. We next move now, so, so we want to keep that in mind, that the man's job to work and to keep the garden, and to you can help yourself to all the trees except for the one tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's not for you to take and eat. Uh, you eat of that, you will surely die. Okay. Then we have the next section, which moves into uh, the woman, the, the attention turns now to the woman. And let's take a look at her place here. Um, Claudette, would you get that for us? We'll start, uh, I'm going to try to get it all up there as best I can, but 18, uh, let's just do 18 to 22. Okay. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to all the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Okay, so we're reviewing now again with the woman. What is the purpose of the woman? What job does she have in this? He creates, the Lord God creates her um what is her purpose to be his yeah, helper. helper yeah her work is in relationship to the man so the man's 
work is relationship to the garden that God has given to him to work and keep it. The woman's work is in relationship to the man, in a sense, to, to, to keep the man, to help him in this. Her attention is upon him, and as his attention is upon uh, on the garden that God has given to him and the home that they're going to build. And then he then can create, he, he names all the things, and none of the animals can fit this for him. And so how does the Lord make the woman um, unlike the other animals that he just grabs dust and makes, how does he make the woman? Part of the man. Yeah. So you can see the woman is from the man and the woman is for the man. She comes from him and she is to be his helper for him. Um, that's going to be very important to, to understand when we get to the curse of how, how this affects everything here. All right, so then the man acknowledging this concludes, verse 23 to uh, 25. Uh, Bob Fowler, would you read that for us? Then the man said, this is, at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Okay. So the man acknowledges, he sings this song, bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. And again, acknowledge she is taken out of man. So she's from the man, taken from him, and she is to be his helper in all these things. Um, and then he gives that beautiful few verses to conclude it on the institution of marriage. The man leaves the father and mother, holds fast to the wife, they become one flesh. And the innocence of it all, they haven't yet eaten, of. they don't have the knowledge of good and evil, and so they are naked and they're unashamed. Um, beautiful picture of their intimacy and love and faith. Everything is perfect. Okay. So we come now once again to the, the curse and the fall. We'll start with the fall again. Let's just read it one more time, just as a quick review of it. Um, uh, verses one, chapter three, verses one to seven. Um, let's see. Uh, Rob Roy, would you get that far? Okay. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you, shall, uh, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves willing cloths. Okay. I don't know if you can see this, but there's an unraveling going on here of the things that we saw and we delighted in in chapter two are now coming undone. Look at how it ends. Um, how does this passage end as once they eat that fruit? What's the first thing? They cover their nakedness. Yeah, they see their nakedness. We, we ended chapter two with they were both naked and unashamed. Now they are ashamed. And then we go forward here. What was the, what was the purpose of the, um, of the woman? What was her job again? Help her. Yeah. To help the man. And what is the woman doing in this scene? Helping him go wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she's 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 she is leading the man away. She's hurt and she's the, what she's doing is not helping. She's actually encouraging him to do evil here, um, going against her calling. She's been there to help the man, and <coughs> she has been abandoning that post. And what's the man's job in this? What's his job? If you remember, to work and keep the garden. 
the work can keep the garden, right? And in relation to his wife, he leaves everything to become one with her. Um, he is the worker and the keeper, and he's doing none of it. Uh, the thing about the man that's striking is he's the one who has been given the job to work and to keep, and he is remarkably passive in this. The idea is the man is there, you don't even know it, and he's there the whole time. Um, when it comes out that she says she gave the fruit to her husband who was with her, we had no idea that the man was even with her mm -hmm. at this point until, until it's stated there in verse 6. So the man abandons his post. His job was to work and to keep the garden and to not eat from the tree of the life. And he does the exact opposite. He eats from the tree that the God had said not to. And he does nothing as far as uh, the work he's been attending to. And he's very passive in this and allows for his wife uh, to, to lead him astray in this. So everyone is abandoning their roles. And if we go further, we would suggest that the serpent, if you remember who we find out later is a cherubim and who is one of the, who is a guardian in the garden, probably given the job to guard the tree, betrays his post in giving the fruit that is forbidden. So it's just, it's an absolute rebellion from beginning to end, uh, unraveling everything that was clearly stated for them in chapter two. So we left off last time we had the, the confrontation uh, that God calls them out. And of course, what was their response when the Lord called to each of them and said, Adam, did you, what happened here? Eve, what happened here? What was going on? The blame game. Yeah, absolutely. Blame game. Adam, who does he blame? The woman. Yeah. The woman and, and maybe even the Lord. When he says, the woman you gave me, uh, she gave it to me and I ate. He chose to listen to the woman instead of the Lord. And the woman blames who? The serpent. The serpent. Yeah. The but snake. she was the one who chose to listen to the serpent and not to the Lord. And, and not to the word that the God had given to her through her husband. So don't, don't you right. think it, don't you, it's unstated, but don't you think it's significant that God even gave a command? That that he that I mean. I, I've heard people say, why did he tell them not to eat of that tree? Yeah. And um, typically I've heard theologians talk about uh, it was the one command. He gave one command and it made it clear to them who was on top of the heap. And it wasn't them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And he, he'd given them other commands too, like be fruitful and multiply. There's mm -hmm. a command for them too, and to work and keep it. So he gives them commands. There's one prohibition so far. Um, yeah. Th 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 now, again, I think th there's a lot you can maybe read into it and see how things go. But, you know, keeping in mind that in this chapters one and two, we have this intersection of heaven and earth where God is pleased to dwell on earth and the heavenly hosts are interacting with <laughs> man and the woman. And so at least in the garden, which is on this mountain, there's this intersection happening. So it's he is still maintaining boundaries. That was remember that was the point of uh, of the creation that that the boundaries are good. When he separates the light from the dark, when he separates the heavens above from the heavens the earth below, that he's a god of order and there's a separation of these realms. And what seems to be happening is that the temptation is this discontent with that separation. You want what isn't yours. So this is human nature. The minute you tell a child, don't go in that room, don't look in this box, they cannot help but want what is forbidden them. And so we kind of see that with their, their motivation for wanting to eat the fruit is because they want it to be like God, or I, I think more, more accurately, like the gods, like the spiritual beings. They want it to be like them. And they were not content in their place. So it wasn't enough for them to be given dominion over the earth. They wanted the heavens as well, just as it wasn't content for the serpent to be a, a cherub in the, in the most exalted cherub in, among the, the spiritual beings. He wanted to be above God himself. So, all right. So that's where we left it off. And we had... Uh, the first was the curse of the serpent, um, and uh, verses 14 and 15, let me pull this down a little bit here, 
And where we leave off here. Um, Carol, uh, would you read for us uh, chapter 3, 14 and 15, and uh, the curse of the serpent? Sure. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Okay. And that's where we see the first gospel, first hope given to us. He says that the, so first thing that serpent, whatever he looks like is, has been humiliated now, cast down like a snake in the grass to eat the dust uh, becomes the Lord of the dead. And then he says, but verse 15 is the, probably the most important verse. Um, what's the promise here? He says, first, I will put enmity between whom? Whoopsie. The serpent and the woman. The serpent and the woman. It's really interesting that uh, the the focus of the evil one is on the woman. Is that why I don't like snakes? Could be, could be, you know, <laughs> you're seeing something. Um, but his target is the woman. And it's really interesting in this day and age that we live in, what you're seeing with all the, the madness in society is it's, it's an all out attack on womanhood. It's not attack on men. Goodness, men are, men are coming up big here. Men Young men right now are having their dreams come true as they are, they're allowed to go into women's bathrooms and locker rooms now. Uh, men are winning women, women of the year awards. Men are dominating women's sports. Um, and the whole world is celebrating this madness, but it's this, there's always been this hostility from the evil one toward the woman. Um, why, let me ask you this, why would the devil hate the woman? Um, what's going on there? Why does he target her? Why not the man? Any thoughts on that? Because she can uh, produce and um, and maybe uh, direct her husband a little. She certainly has a civilizing effect on her husband. That's for sure. Um, but yeah, you. Yeah, I think. I think I've, it very definitely is that she she's the one who brings life into this world. Um, she's the one who nurtures it and creates a home. Um, the man without the woman is an absolute beast and an animal. Um, and the but the woman, man, it's it's she she brings grace and that gentleness and the spirit. And and when he makes this promise, there's going to be this fight now between the evil one and the woman, and between the offspring of the evil one, the, the serpent. Uh, the offspring of the serpent are those who uh, carry on the will of the evil one, who are the violent, the aggressors, the persecutors, um, the warriors types. And the offspring of the women are the, are the, the gentle, the humble, uh, the nurturing, the compassionate, the kind. Um, and you're going to see those stories where the the serpent coming in the form of a dragon or, or a pharaoh raging against uh, a humble people. Um, but the end result will be, and this is the mystery of all life, is who wins in this battle? The, the offspring well, of the woman. Yeah. yeah, the son of the woman wins. He's the one who bruises the head who crushes the head, even though he's going to be wounded and bruised, he will crush the head. And that's, that's going to set the tone for all the stories that go forward. We see um, God's people humble, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Noah, Abel, uh, Moses, David, all these just humble ones facing giants and dragons and armies and running for their lives and yet coming out on top um, really setting forth the gospel that we're, our salvation is coming not from a violent force. It's coming from one who has been bruised, um, one who is, will suffer and will be meek and lowly 
Um, so that was the serpent. Now we pick up the woman today. Let's start with her. Verse 16. And where we leave off here, let's see, Carol. Uh, Bob, uh, Bob Thomas? Yes. Yes. Uh, verse 16. Uh, let's talk to the woman. Yeah. Oh, sorry about that. Lost it. <laughs> okay, got it. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in the childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. All right. So this is the curse of the woman. Let's talk about that. Well, first, curse of the woman. Um, what's the first part of the curse? Pain in childbearing. Yeah, pain in childbearing. Um, and again, remember that the I think we 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 talked about that. That the what makes the woman so special is this: she's brought along to help the man. She comes from the man. She's brought to the man, and she is his helper. And then the man makes himself one with her and the two becoming one. And then in love, she brings forth new life from that. She is the one who carries this, has that great privilege of bringing new life in the world. But now uh, her, her joy uh, in life is now uh, stricken with pain. Um, in pain, she will bring forth children. Um, I don't know, ladies, do you have any, any reflections on this here? Uh, give us some insights into, into that. I so didn't shocked. get pain. The baby's I dropped think, the best. Well, the pain of childbirth is nothing compared to raising them. Okay. <laughs> that's true. You know, that's interesting. <laughs> that's like, especially when they get to be teenagers, and especially yeah. when you have three teenagers at the same time. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's difficult because oftentimes it falls on the mother. You know, the mm -hmm. dad, the father is out working. The mother is, even though in this day and age, women work, the bulk yeah. of the child rearing still falls on the mother. And it's, it's, so, it's hard work. And, and the mother seems to have a, a much deeper bond with the child than the father does. You know, I realized this one day that I think a mother, or at least from my perspective, I certainly probably love my my children more than my children love me back. I mean, they love okay. me, but I hang on to them in a different way than they come to me. You know, yeah. they are they grow up, they have their families, and they move on, and their families are first. But my heart is, I'm I would still die for my children, even though they're mm -hmm. adults. I would die first if I had yeah. to protect them, yeah. and I feel that way about my own mom. I love her dearly, but. I needed to grow away from my mother. She didn't mm. grow away from me. Yeah, yeah. I th I think you told to do that. We're, we're told to you know leave your mother and, and yeah. uh, father and and be one with your spouse. Yeah. Now it's interesting. It's the man who is commanded to leave the father and mother, and to be joined to the wife, uh, to the woman. Um, but it's really interesting that you say that, that 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 it's not just the the moment of birth that is the pain. I mean, you have the nine months before. I don't suspect that they are particularly comfortable as well as no. the and then the and then the raising of the child and the amount of energy expended upon the bond and then to have that love and all that sacrifice scorned in many ways, uh, in different ways um, is. Yeah, um, that is part of the curse that we're given here is that the that which is your passion your whole focus so much is is riddled with pain now and the second part is interesting too it's not just that though what's the second part of the curse for the woman desire contrary to your husband yeah your desire shall be there's a lot of confusion about what that all means you know your desire shall be for your husband um, I think this is interpreting it as um, there's now sort of the battle of the sexes now. You're going to have 
you're not going to have this oneness. It's not going to be easy anymore. Um, you're you're going to now have you're going to be at odds with your husband now. So in a sense, you now have stress in your relationship to the man. A um, lot of frustration, a lot of miscommunication, a um, lot of battle of wills is going to happen here. And um, and the thing is, um, and you're going to lose in this. And he shall rule over you. Interesting. The NASB says, your, yet your desire will be for your husband. Yeah. That's how the NSB words that. Yeah, so that's that's the question. What does that mean, your desire? Will it be that you'll have this longing for your husband? Um, or is it a longing to sort of rule over your husband or to uh, control control the situation? Um, that's, what, that's what the ESV would lead you to believe. That's what that yeah, means. Yeah, but it's clear that you'll notice whatever it means, I think we can we can affirm it's true. That um, the, the, the stress, the tension, the, the hard work it takes in a marriage for a couple to, um, to just to get on the same page and to be truly rooting for each other. It's, it's unfortunately, there's, there's a reason why um, so many marriages end in divorce. And by the way, right now, I'm hearing that like 80% of divorces today are initiated by the woman. Mm-hmm. A high number of women are the ones initiating these divorces. There is this discontent. And a lot is because our society has been telling them that the roles of a woman in the home are to be scorned. Um, you, they're never celebrated anymore. It used to be celebrated. It used to have TV shows and the mom, and it was celebrated, you know, and now it's scorned. The woman has to be the owner of the company and the hero, the savior of the world and, and play the role of the man. And, and so her traditional roles in the raising children and, and supporting her husband are absolutely scorned today. Uh, they don't even have the option of being these things. And, uh, but in any case, you know, I, know- I think about, I think about, I, I pray about the men in our country a lot in, in our morning prayer group, because I, and from my perspective, and especially since we've talked, been talking about these first few chapters in Genesis that, I really believe that in our country, the men are losing their respect from people, women as yeah. the leader. And I think, uh, you know, you. I think a woman like a wife, I want a strong husband. I want him to be the leader. And yes, we have our differences of opinion, but yeah. I want to know is he's, he's the protector role. I'm the nurturing role. Yeah. So I want him to, I really want him to have that final Mm -hmm. ruling because i need to be able to look to him to take care of me as i take care of the children right because my children are grown up but i think that men are falling away from that as women become more and more powerful in in jobs and in government in this country men men oftentimes lose out job opportunities to women so I think men just are falling by the wayside and saying yeah. whatever is going on in their minds, you know, who cares? They don't, yeah. they don't listen to me. Yeah. And it, I think there's part of the struggle. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think, you know, feminism, remember the motto of feminism that a woman needs a man like a fish needs a bicycle. You know, have you heard that? No, a strange I'm analogy. I don't remember it. A strange and stupid it. analogy, but they use it all the time. It's a woman needs a man like a fish needs a bicycle. Women don't need men. You go, girl. You don't need men. And so they are, they're, they're constantly encouraged. You're independent. You're strong. You don't need a man. And um, you can take care of yourself. And they're creating a lot of misery in women because God has not made the woman to be distinct from the man. Um, she's, she's her, her greatest joys is in being in that helper to him and, uh, in the, in the raising of children, in the nurturing, in the helping, the comforting, the encouraging, and, uh, it's all been stressed and cursed now. Um, but the worst part is that women are basically encouraged now to find their joy, um, in the curse, not in the blessing. 
in uh, in being in furthering that division from the man and and seeking to to break free from the man and find their own independence. And then even forsaking childbearing altogether um, so that they're not having children or the ones that they're having, having are they're aborting. Um, and there's just so much they're supposed to bring bringing life into the world and they're bringing death and it's just a mess. It's an absolute mess. And uh, this is comes from the curse that we've seen. Um, so you know, with that, I, yeah, I, I also see, um, I mean, I don't watch much TV now, so I don't know if it's changed, but it just seemed like for the longest time, it seemed like the TV always portrayed the men as being stupid. Mm -hmm. they, they were yeah. the joke. They were the what anything but being actually decent at something. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's been going on since what, what was it the probably the eighties or nine? I can't remember. It's been a while they've been doing this, but more so than ever. I mean, the, yeah. You watch a movie, and uh, here's something interesting. I, I heard. Uh, do you know the actress Evangeline Lilly? Have you heard of her? She, if you like the Marvel movies, she plays the Wasp in uh, the Ant Man movies. She was in the show Lost. If you remember that show, back years ago. But anyway, she's a, she's a pretty popular actress. And she said, she, she's not a Christian as far as I know. I don't think she's, I don't think she's a traditional woman either, but she just said, she, she says, what's going on? He says, how come a, a man who behaves like a woman is celebrated, but a woman who behaves like a woman is scorned? And how come... A woman who behaves like a man is celebrated, but a man who behaves like a man is scorned. If you, I've even noticed this. He says, if you watch any of the movies, it's like the women behave like men. They're the ones that are celebrated. They're the heroes. They're the ones saving the day. They're the ones beating up guys. Sometimes they have these stupid movies where a single woman in high heels beats up like six trained professional hitmen in a scene, just kicking them with their high heels. It's ridiculous. Uh, but they have to keep showing this. Uh, she's the tough guy. Uh, and then the men, if they're heroes in the movie, they're always homosexual or they're transgender or they have no sense of masculinity. They're just a supportive guy, you know, coming alongside, playing the role of the woman, the helper. They're, they're coming along, supporting the woman in her dreams. And everything's reversed. It's, it's like it's a rebellion. It's still part of the rebellion against God's good order. So... All right, let's take a look at the next part here. The, the curse of the man. I, yeah, Michael, go ahead. Before you go on, go back to, not to nitpick, but the pain of childbearing. Is that correct? The joy I will of, the other side, you life, know. No, the joy of life is not stricken with pain. It, it oh, sorry. Uh, Your joy of life is uh, now, how about that, stricken with pain. Okay. Thank you, Bob. I was going to say, I didn't, it didn't sound right. because We just talked about all Yeah, that. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. My team of editors here. Excellent. Thank you. Auto correct. Let's talk about the curse of the woman. I curse of the man now. Um, and it's a different kind of curse, but it explains a lot too. Um, so what do we leave off here? Uh, Claude, Claudette, would you read the, the curse of the man here at verses 17 to 19? Mm -hmm. And to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Okay. Um, it's interesting. He speaks to Adam in verse 17, but it's the to the woman in verse 16. How come he doesn't speak to Eve? Just a quick note. He, doesn't, he just says to Adam, but it doesn't say to Eve, he said. <laughs> well, I know there's a, second Adam, there's a second Adam coming, so I know that has something to do with it. Well, there's actually a real simple reason. It's, it's, it's in verse 20. Is that uh, he, has, he hasn't named her yet. Named her yet. <laughs> yeah, because in, in that, those previous verses, he did talk to her because he said, your pain, your, yes. your pain in childbirth will be increased. 
He talked to her, but he didn't. You know, so Adam hasn't named her yet as Eve. He will name her next in verse 20. So st- to this point, she's still the woman. Uh, the woman you've given to me. Um, so to Adam, he says, um, what's the reason for the curse here for him? Because, because he didn't listen to his wife and he ate of the tree. He ate yes. of the tree. That was it. Because you listened to the voice of your wife. That's Instead less of him. Okay. <laughs> and not the commandment of God. That's the, it's not a, not a sin to listen to your wife. The sin is when your wife says something contrary to the word of God. Um, remember, she is, Adam, uh, Adam's focus is on the Lord. Uh, and his job is to hear the voice of the Lord. And he's the one who gives the word to the to the wife. In this case, it had been reversed. He listened to the voice of his wife, and he ate of it. So now, because of that, what is the result? What is cursed here? The ground. Cursed is the ground because of you. Okay, because of the man, the ground is cursed, not the woman, uh, because of the man. And what will that mean for him? A lot of crabgrass. Say that one more time. Said a lot of crabgrass and weeds. <laughs> yes. Uh, you're right now. And the first thing he says is, your, your work now? Well, it'd be hard. Yeah. Exhausting. Tough work. It's like she had uh, pain in childbearing. Uh, Adam will have pain in his work now. That was was he was he made for his joy was will be in keeping and working the garden. The joy of the man is in in doing the work um, that God has given him to do to tend and keep that which He's given him to take care of. There's a great joy in that, and I think as as men. You know, we feel that joy. There's a, during COVID, when they were giving checks, free checks to people for not working, what a disaster that was. And so much because they they kept thinking that the purpose of work is simply to, to pay your bills and put food on the table. And for the man, it's not that. Uh, the, the purpose God has made us, our souls, that's our whole purpose of life is to be productive to work and to keep the good things, to be creative and a man's joy. And you steal that from him and you steal his soul. His whole purpose is gone. This, by the way, is why um, I saw the statistic years ago, but apparently in, I think it was in New York, that the average age, when, when a man retires, his average life expectancy after retirement was two years. We're on borrowed time, Bob. We <laughs> are. <laughs> and, and I think I really think the, the reason is that so many of these men, when they retired, they lost their very reason for living. Mm-hmm. They've been made to work. They're not, we're different from women. Women that don't feel that need as much as a man does. We have been made to work. And even though we're looking forward to retirement, once we get there, we're like, I've lost all purpose in life. I'm useless. And once, once a man feels useless, it's over. Mm-hmm. It's over. And so many, that's why so many guys who, who retire, they can survive many years, but they have to find another purpose. Uh-huh. They have to find another work, a usefulness for them. Um, and so for, for many women, like, uh, the funny thing is we had, I don't know if you guys remember John O'Neill. He yeah. was a guy at church. He lived till he was like 91 years old um, before he died. But he was working to the end. He would, after he retired, he was working a part-time job for many years, even doing things like taking dogs for walks and things like that. And and people were always warning him, you got a bad heart, you're going to kill yourself doing this stuff. And, and my feeling was, no, that's what's keeping him alive is doing those things. Um, we've been made to work. You know, my dad my dad was brought up during the depression and um he was um he always worked very hard all his life he tried many times in his probably his 60s and early 70s to retire mm. but 
it, he, the kind of work he did, he was he took care of the, the sewing machines in the shoe shops. So as the shoe shops started to go away, there were not young men going into that trade. Mm. So the people who would try and start new new uh, shoe shops would call him or any of the other older guys to come back to work. So my dad would come back, go back to work. My dad finally stopped working when he was 81 and a half and he was, wow. he was very healthy. And mm. he, he was probably on maybe one blood pressure medication. That was it. After he stopped working, he went downhill really fast and he had one health problem after another. And he was so depressed and he just, yeah. he, he did die at 89, but yeah. he, his life, he, he was really amazing until he stopped working. That's interesting. That's so true. That is so true. I saw the same thing with my dad too. When he, when he finally retired, it was like his, uh, he still kept himself pretty busy. Um, but it was like something changed in him too. Uh, and not in a, in a good way. That's really interesting. So, uh, pain in his work, um, there'll be now thorns and thistles. So now come the weeds and the thorns and all the things that aren't supposed to grow. Uh, pain is worth to be trouble and sweat. Um, you shall eat bread. And ultimately, what is it? How is it going to end for him? Return to the ground. So you return to the ground. Okay, dust to dust. Now, a couple notes on, on this, these curses. I want you to see something here. God's curse, there's a mercy in it. In both cases, um, re regarding these curses, he does not take away from them their purpose. So the man and the woman do not lose their purpose and joy in life. The woman still will give birth to children, and she'll still have relationship with her husband and can and will be able to serve him. The man will be able to work the ground. He'll continue to have that purpose of work. Um, the problem is that now the, the curse is not that these are going to be taken from them, but that they will be hard. Mm. So that's it. Um, so um, now... Now these purposes will bring pain. Will be about that. I you know what I, I noticed? No, go ahead, Bob. Oh, I was just going to say that I I wonder when when I see this, and I wonder what heaven is like. I mean, his original plan was for us to, you know, tend the garden, and uh, do we? Is that going to be our job in heaven? Well, we will have some work to do there. Yeah. That's going to be amazing. What that what will that look like? I mean, uh, what what is it going to look like? We we don't understand work without the curse. Although although to be honest with you, you I think many most of us have had at least glimpses of what work can be without the curse. So just imagine if you've ever been a part of a of a team with a vision and a clarity and a purpose and things are kind of falling into place and they're, they're working out and you really get a sense. And sometimes it's like being on a championship team or being on something, a, a real healthy environment um, where, where the sin of man has been at least for the moment minimized. There's some kind of special grace there. And there's such a joy and an energy to be a part of something like that. It's thrilling and exciting. And so you just get a little taste of it sometimes. Maybe you work for a great company you know, or you're part of a great organization or part of a good team. And you and you really feel a deeper satisfaction of what things could be. Um, it's, uh, that can be exciting. And, and uh, I'll give, I'll give you an example here of uh, my, my son right now with his jobs, he had uh, his, his first job that he ever had was um, at the Ainsbury chair at the chair factory. Um, he's working full time and he spent 10 hours a day, basically putting chairs together on this assembly line, the most soul destroying work you can imagine for a young man. He comes in, we started in the wintertime. He would get up at 
six in the morning, it's dark out and he'd get to work and he wouldn't get out till after five when it's dark out. So he didn't see the light of day and he's working with just two people and it's just miserable. And he's, he's ready. He's going to go insane <laughs> in a moment. Right. And so he, <laughs> he can't take it. It's like, it's driving him crazy because it's monotonous. It's boring. It's, it's just a paycheck. It's all anything else other than the money. There's no joy in this, in this job whatsoever. Um, and now he's, he's got this job at first. It was scary for him, but he's traveling to different places. He's, he's making good friends with the guys he's working with. He really starts to enjoy them. And he's getting a taste of what work can be beyond the check that comes in, that there is a pleasure in he's building these car washes and completing things and seeing things done and, and working together with a team. And there's a, there's still the curse there, but it's not the full blast of it that he was feeling before it, there's some grace in it too that he's starting to feel so um so just imagine now if we could remove all the curses from this uh that we can pursue our purposes um in a way that just brings maximum happiness to us um what that looks like i'm not sure but I, i've uh, had jobs like that i mean literally where they put together dream teams and, yeah. and it was fabulous, but it was all doing things that I cannot possibly imagine us a needing with God, you know, yeah. Heaven. Yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> and so I, so I, I guess for me, it's like, I just don't know. I mean, it's, you, I can't speak to that world. All I can say is I got a taste of it occasionally here. Yeah. And, 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 and I think it was Jonathan Edwards described it this way. It's like, those moments of grace are like little little brooks that that uh, come down from a, a high mountain fountain source, and they get to us, and we get a little taste of the refreshment. But now imagine, after tasting that, what it must be like at the source when you're right there in that full fountain of joy and peace. It's just like you're just giving a little taste, and it just gives me enough to know that whatever it is, I don't know what it's going to be like, but whatever it is, I want it. I want as much of it as possible. Um, and that's what our eternal home is like, is when the curse will be lifted and the joys will return to us. And yeah, I don't know how it works, but it does somehow, somehow. So a lot to look forward to. All right, let's finish up uh, 20 to 24. Um, Let's see, where do we leave off here? Um, Bob Fowler, did you get that for us? Um, let's actually, let's start with uh, 20 and 21. Just do that, that one paragraph there. The man called his wife's name Eve. Sorry about that. Go ahead. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Okay. All right, so now we have um, the curse is over, has been declared. And so we could see this as um, the, the grace of God coming into this now. And the first thing you see is the man. And, and what, what does the man do here? Names his wife. Yeah. The man called his wife. Eve. What does Eve mean, by the way? Anyone have a note on that? Uh, I knew at one time. A mother of the living or something like that. Yeah, that's what it says here. Mother of all living. There should be a note on that somewhere. Related to Hebrew word hey for living. Okay. So Eve means living. Um, take note of that. She is the mother of all living. Notice, notice his name for her is Eve, living. What have we seen so far? Um, since the fall, since the sin, uh, there's been a, a, a word that's come up a few times here already. Um, regarding the serpent, dust you shall eat. The last words to the man were, dust you are, to dust you shall return. Has been a word of death for them. But Adam sees in his wife now, sees the one who will bring life 
back. Uh, it's through the woman that life will return. And that's that's the hope of salvation. It foretells what he told the, the serpent, the offspring of the woman, and he will bruise your head. He's the one who will restore. Uh, she's the mother of all the living. And then we have, uh, and then we have the second part is, uh, so this is, we'll say this is um, hope uh, in the midst of death. And then we have the Lord doing something. What does the Lord do? Made them garments of skins and clothe and clothe them. He makes clothes out of animal skins. Uh, for the man, for Adam and his wife. What's the significance of that? Blood is shed. Yeah. Well, for, for one thing, it shows he's smarter than man was because I actually have a fig tree. And the interesting thing about fig trees is that the leaf and even the fruit before it's ripe has this like latex sap that is very itchy and irritating. Huh. That's interesting. So if they're if they're covering themselves in fig leaves, they're going to be itching a lot. Oh, that's interesting. That the, their, their own covering is torturing them. Yeah. Thing. So here the Lord makes clothes out of animal skins for Adam and his wife. And there's there's two parts we can look at. One is that you're right. Um, blood ha a sacrifice has been made. Someone has died to cover them. Um I, I, we'll call it a life has died to cover uh, the man and the woman. And you can see this also, it's that this covering of their shame. Remember, they saw they were naked. The Lord covers their shame. Uh, that's going to be a theme we're going to see later on, too. If you remember with the, you're going to have a reenactment of the fall with Noah after the flood where he's plants a garden plants the, and then he gets drunk and he's lying naked in his tent and his son Ham does not cover his shame but exposes him but his son Shem and Japheth do cover him um, that's going to be a, a noble theme of the goodness of God his grace of covering a sin and there's a passage in, in uh, I think it's Peter where he says love covers a multitude of sins that's this, uh, the way of the Lord, to cover their shame, not to expose them to further ridicule and disgrace. He could easily do that, um, but he covers them before he sends them off. Um, let's pick it up from there now. Uh, that's the grace of God there. And now we're going to move to the last few verses, 22 to 24. And um, let's see, Rob, would you get that for us? Okay. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us <clears throat> in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man and, and at the east of the garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. All right, so the Lord now speaks. Uh, to whom is he speaking, by the way? Looks like he's speaking to either the inner Trinitarian thing or uh, speaking to the uh, heavenly host. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think, well, certainly the Jews wouldn't have had the concept of the Trinity um, when they wrote, when they read this first. But uh, yeah, he's speaking to the heavenly host. The Lord has said, um, behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Uh, now, lest he reach out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever, he will drive him out. So let's talk about that for a second. Um, so, so the man has become like the heavenly beings in what way? Knowing good and evil. In knowing good and evil. That's the, that's the way that, that, that now they have... He has insight now. He is um, he's no longer innocent. Uh, no longer can he live freely and just trust the Lord to handle all the inner workings. He now has 
been exposed. He now sees uh, a little bit more, and that's uh, that's a problem now. Um, that he is uh, seeing things he he shouldn't see and knows things he shouldn't know. But now um, his concern is what? If he gets his hand on the tree of of uh, life, he could basically clean cleanse himself. Well, let's talk about that for a second. Would the tree of life cleanse the man? Well, it would give him life. Yes. He must not take from the tree of life. Otherwise, he will live forever. Why is that a problem? Well, part of the curse is he's going to die. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, the point, the reason. But he'd also live forever in sin, wouldn't he? Yes. Yes, he would basically, he would be like a vampire, an eternal cursed creature, mm. is what we're dealing with here. This is a monster. This is not a good thing. Um, so the, the curse, the mercy of, well, put it this way here. Uh, you know, we know that the, the wages of sin is death, right? Uh, that is the justice of God. But it is also the mercy of God that sin has an expiration date. Mm -hmm. You know, if sin is allowed, is not put an end to it, if we just said the wages of sin is suffering, that would be horrifying. But the wages of sin is death, which is, which is in one sense a terrifying thing, and yet is a mercy because it puts an end to it. You know, there's a reason we're not afraid of Adolf Hitler anymore. He's dead, you know, and, and all the terrorists and all the people who, the serial killers that are out there and all the rapists who have been put to death or killed or died in some ways, when they're dead, they're no longer afraid to us. They're done. It's over. And so we cannot allow one who is in a cursed state um, to live forever. It has to come to an end. Um, so that's why the tree of life will not reappear again until Revelation 22, when the curse is lifted, and the, and then no, we're no longer the sinful people. We're, we're now glorified, and now we are fit to live forever. Um, not until we get those resurrection bodies will we get to live forever. Um, because frankly, let me ask you this question, ladies and gentlemen. Would you like to live forever in your present state? No. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely not. I wouldn't want that. Um, just get older and more pain and just like, oh, awful. Shriveling up like a little raisin until you're just, there's nothing left of you. It's just awful. Um, it's a mercy of God that there is, that he keeps the tree of life from them at this point. Um, and so then, therefore, what happens? He, uh, there's a couple things here. Um, he sent him out of the garden to work the ground from which he was taken. So now he, you'll notice that his purpose is not to tend to the garden anymore. So the man's new purpose is what? Work the ground. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. And eat of the plants which before it looked like he was, they were just eating of the tree. So all they had to do is pick, pick the fruit and eat it. Yeah. Now he has to work on it. He has to make bread. Yeah. It's work. Yeah. Now the new purpose to work the ground, not the garden of Eden anymore. That's taken from him. And uh, he drives out the man and notice the, the, the direction that's been given here. Um, the Lord drives out the man and where does he put the cherubim? The east. He's guarding the tree. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He places the cherubim, that guardian. The east gate. At the east of the garden. And with it, a flaming sword. Let's talk about a flaming sword. What does that represent? Word of God. Yeah, the word, the sword, the word of God is a sword. Flames are judgment. Yeah, 
two-edged sword. It's a it's a word of judgment. Yeah. Uh, the flames of judgment. Uh, the sword of judgment too, as well. So it's a. Um, this is the judgment here. We've been cast out, and there's no way back. It guards every way to guard the way to the tree of life. There is no getting to the tree of life. The tree of life is completely away from us now. He puts it in the east, and that's going to kind of help you understand some of the directions of why, for example, the temple is, you know, where the temple is on the on the mount, on which side of it it is? It faces the east. It faces the east. It's 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 in the west. There is no west gate in the temple. There was yeah. a north gate, a south gate, and an east gate. The temple was against the west wall. That's the 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 wailing wall now today. The the, the that was the that was where the temple was set up against that. So it didn't have a the west is where God is, according to that. That's where his home is in the west. And so when you're moving to the east, you're moving away from God. You're being driven away from God. And so that's why later on, when you see um, Cain being, he goes east of Eden. Um, when you see um, the Tower of Babel, they they build it in a plain in the east. It's symbolic of them being oh, far away from God. And then when Christ is born, if you remember, where do the wise men come from? The um, east. They come from the east. They're returning to God. So there's, there's a little bit of directional theology in there. As you go so that, does that have some significance to the title of the book, East of Eden, that was written by John Steinbeck? I've never read the book, but I, I know he got that phrase from Genesis. Yeah, I, I, I'm assuming that's where he got it from, East of Eden. Um, I never read the book. Did you read the book? I read it in high school, but it was I was so, you know, at that age, I didn't yeah. understand it. So. But they worked hard. You know, the locust. I think that was the story about the locust that came and wiped out all the fields. I think that was the one. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense of why the, the the that was the curse against Cain is that the ground would no longer yield to you. You're going to have no success with the ground. Um, it's going to be very, very interesting. So, all right. We'll close it here. Any last comments or questions before we break? That's good. All right.